So hello everyone, thank you for the introduction. So as been said, I'll talk a bit about nearest neighbor queries and specifically in Julia using this nearest neighbors package that I've made. Um, okay, <laughs> so what is a near nearest neighbor query? So say first we have some set of data like a point cloud, set of n-dimensional points, so it could be maybe a location of planets or something, it could be cells in some biology simulations, we could have vertices in a mesh, or you know, a set of points, pretty much. And then we have these queries we want to make. So for some defined metric, which is like a distance function, so typically you could use the Euclidean distance, which is just the one we all know, but there are other ways of computing distances. So for some sort of distance functions, we can ask questions like, KNN, which is source for uh, finding the K nearest neighbors in a data set of some query points. So basically we have some point and we want to find the 10 nearest neighbors to that point. Or we can also have an in-range query. So if we have a point and we want to find all the other points within some range of that point. And we often want to do multiple queries on the same data then, so we don't want to do this once, but we want to do this many, many times. So different applications could be we can have some colli collision detection in ray tracing, shortest path algorithms, and we have some mesh, and we want to find uh, the neighboring elements uh, towards some point in a mesh. So different approaches then. Well, the naive approach is just to loop over the input set, and we compute the distances to the data point. And we can just check this if the, po if the point is in the range, or we can have some list of the k-nearest neighbors that we update as we iterate through all the points. Now the problem with this is that there's no structure in the input data, so the next time we do this search we have to start from scratch. So kind of in these pictures here, we know we're looking through all our points and we're trying to find the closest one, and then we do again and we start looking through again. So it scales very badly here, we have to, since we're doing the, all the comparisons possibly pretty much. And as the sort of the end input here, as our data set becomes a bit big, this becomes, as you can see, uh, kind of prohibitively expensive. So we need to do something better than this. So one different approach could be some kind of binning strategy. So here I put some pseudo Julia code. We have a bin which contains a set of vectors here. Uh, that point, that's a vector of indices to some points. And then we have all our bins then in some array. So if we have a uniform spread of points here, we have a binning structure and we have some points in there. And if we want to find all the points that are in range of some point, we can just pretty quickly calculate what are the possible bins these point can be in and we can loop over those and we can find the things that are actually in there. Now the problem here is that the binning strategy does not work very well if the data is non-uniform. So if you see here, here I have some exponential distribution, you can see that most, almost all points end up in this bin here and at that point you're almost back to the previous case where you're searching through all points. And it's also, as you increase the dimension of the points, the number of bins you get quite quickly expands. You know, it has a power of the dimension here. So if you have uh, 100 by 100, it's 10,000 bins. Maybe that's possible, but then you have a third dimension and, you know, the number of mins, bins goes up very quickly. And most interesting data, I would say, is not uniform. I mean, there's the reason we're looking into it is it has some kind of structure and then using this type of uniform binning is not uh, really workable. So instead we can look at some tree-based approaches. So the, the idea here is we have some kind of a binary tree and each node in this tree represents uh, a subset of the parent of that tree's space. So we're basically recursively uh, partitioning up the space. And uh, we also want these nodes so that the combined space of the child nodes, the two nodes, the parent, includes all the points contained in the parent space. I will show some example of this later so it's not so abstract. And the point then is as we traverse the tree down, we want to be able to throw away as much of these uh, subtrees as we can so we don't have to do many comparisons. So if we look at a concrete example here, we have a KD tree. So what we do then is we have a set of points here, I hope it's visible. And then the first we just draw a box around all the points. And then we find what dimension does the point have the largest spread in. So here it turns out to be the x dimension. And then we split the points on, we could take the, the median for example in the x dimension. So it's split there. And then we basically do the same thing but on the two resulting 
uh, subspaces that we got. So we split again. Here it turned out to be the y uh, dimension on both of these split that was the, the larger, largest spread. And then we continue and we get some kind of a partitioning of the space like this. And we do this until the number of points in each of these areas is less than some defined number, which is called the leaf node size. So if we count here, maybe it's one, two, three, that's eight or something, and then we say, okay, now, now we're done. Uh, one problem with the KD tree is that it also, it's not great when the dimensionality is, is very high. It loses some e efficiency there. But if you want to think a little bit in terms of code then, we could have some kind of a structure which is called a bounding box. So it's basically in an n-dimensional box where the minimums and the maximums are. And then we have a KD node here. So this root node would be that thing. And then we have two pointers. We have a left child and a right child that points to those two there. Both do those have a bounding box. And then we have a set of points that we only use when we're down at the sort of the, the leaf node. So this in sort of simple way could be one way to structure this this tree. It's called a KD tree. So we can look a little bit how the resulting KD tree looks for various distributions here. So here's a normal distribution. And you know, in a normal distribution, typically have the points more close to the center. So you can see here that on the edges, we have these large areas, while as the points get closer, we have cut them up a bit more finely. For the exponential distribution, we have more points towards uh, low values. So here we have very big boxes here, but very small over here. And if you remember, this was in the binning case, this is one of the, the bad cases where we had one box here that was pretty big that had a lot of points in them, but now we see we have sort of cut up things more finely there. And if this is another example, if we have more spread in one dimension than the other, we see we have done more sort of cuts there to sort of the, the boxes are kind of the same size there. So well, what's the point of this? Well, when we do a query then on a KD tree, we can recurse down this tree and we can throw away things that we know we don't have to look at. So an example here, we have a bunch of points here and we want to find every point inside the range of this orange point here. Well, if we go down one step and we look at the, the bounding boxes we have here, we can see that this part here, we know, does not intersect with this ball. So no point in here can, in fact, be within that range. So we don't have to go down here and search at all. So in terms of the tree, then, it means we don't have to go down this path at all. We can just stop it there. But this one, there might be points that are within there in this one. So we go down another level. Now we're here, and we have these two ones. But then we know that this box here does not intersect this one. So we can keep going down here and sort of throwing away stuff until we get to the, the bottom. And then typically we have something, maybe we have a few here that we know can intersect, and then we do the checks with ideally only a few points then that we have to compute the distance to. So I have some pseudocode here for how an in-range uh, function would look. We would check if the node is a leaf, and if it is, then we have to actually go through all the points and compute the distances, which is expensive. And if it's not a leaf, we have to see, does this node maybe uh, intersect? In that case, we have to go down it, otherwise we can just do nothing. So that was a KD tree. There's also something called a ball tree, which is similar to a KD tree, but it uses balls or circles or sphere, depends what dimension you're in. So these were kind of similar to KD tree, but uh, so uh, for example, this uh, node here or this sphere has five points in it. And then we have, let's see which one the other one here. Here is the other node, leaf node for here. And then around that we have a bigger circle. And then so it's like circles all the way up instead of hyper rectangles. And these are a difference here is if you look at the uh, KD tree here, you can see that the, the union of all the spaces here completely fill out the full thing. While that is not true for a ball tree, we have these parts that are not filled out. For example, this is not uh, inside any of the leaf nodes. So what this means is that this can work better in high dimensions than a KD tree, but it depends a bit on, on the data set. 
So if you want to be a bit technical, if the data exists in some like sub manifold in a lower dimension than the actual points are in, then a ball tree is usually good. And to like queer down, you do kind of exactly the same thing as with the KD tree, except in the KD tree case, we looked here as a does the circle intersect this rectangle? Well, in the ball tree, you would have to check if the if a circle intersects another circle, and in that case, you recurse down. So that was a bit general stuff about nearest neighbor search, and I want to talk specifically about this nearest neighbors package. It's a bit special to me because it was the first Julia package I ever wrote. It started out as being uh, just kdtrees.jl in 2015, but then I added this ball tree and some other stuff, so then it became nearest neighbors. I checked now, and it's 110 other packages that depend on it. It has this KD tree and ball tree, and it also has something called the brute tree, which is just the, does the naive things, which is kind of useful to just checking if the things are right and checking some performance stuff. The trees in nearest neighbors are static, so you have to create uh, the tree once with all your input points. You cannot update them uh, as they're being after you, as you get new points. You have to create them from scratch. There's only exact searches in it. There's a lot of stuff around approximate nearest neighbor searches, but in nearest neighbors, there's only exact ones. Uh, it uses this distances.jl package with the metrics from that, so it gets access to a large set of metrics basically for, for free. And the API then in this package is quite small, which is nice. You basically create your KD tree, your ball tree, your brew tree with your data. Your data could be a matrix, which is the dimension times the number of uh, points, or it could be a, a vector of all the points and so on. You just choose what metric you want to use, and then there's this reorder thing, which is a performance thing I'll talk about later. And then the queries then is you just want to check what points are within this input data within some radius, or the k nearest point to some input points, and you want to find the, the k nearest neighbor, so maybe the, the 10 nearest or something. So right now I want to talk a little bit about, I guess it's a little bit Julia specific stuff, but also a bit about like performance in general and what some things that gone into nearest neighbors to improve its performance. <coughs> so the first thing is to avoid chasing pointers. So if you remember before, I had this struct KD node, which had a left child and a right child that was also a KD node. So like in, a, in an implementation sense, there would be two pointers to, to different nodes. And as you're kind of going down the tree, you have to chase these pointers. And this typically gets a lot of these called caching misses because the pointers are just somewhere in memory and you have to go fetch them. And then you go one step further down in the tree and you have to fetch the next node somewhere else in the memory. So instead in nearest neighbors, you can store these nodes in an array instead. So you can see here, I didn't take this picture from Julia because it starts at zero, but just imagine it starts at one instead. And you can have these nodes lying out there flat in an array like this, and you can get the left child and the right child with a simple formula then. So if this is the, the root node then, you can do very simple arithmetic to get the left child and the right child, and then so on. So instead of storing things with this left child and right child, we can store them in a vector of nodes, and then have this accessing scheme to get them instead. Uh, there's a question, but I think you hold the question and we'll just do them in the end. I think that would be better. And if you have a balanced tree, you won't have any sort of holes in this area. It will be, there will be no space wasted. So I put a bit of, in the end of all of these slides, I have a bit of guiding principle in the end. So here I put areas are a programmer's best friend. Like areas are very good good in general, especially if you can iterate them, like left to right and so on. The CPU understands them very well. It can do fancy things like prefetching things so you don't have cache misses and a lot of nice stuff. Chasing pointers like this is typically quite slow. Second thing is the size reduction. So uh, one important thing is to, when you get stuff from memory, you want to make the, the stuff you get as small as possible and as relevant as possible. So one thing we can do here is that if you look before, you had this, what points are within a, a certain node. We store this in each node here. But if you 
make if you split it in a certain way, you can basically uh, avoid having that field in a node at all, and you can compute things just based on this on this index. So uh, you can, for example, see if this node is a leaf only based on the index. You can pre-compute that, and you can also see what points are inside a leaf node just from the index and a lookup in another array. So what we can further, we don't need to store the whole bounding box. So as I have here the this bounding box, which is all the mins and maxes, you, you can actually, uh, the, it's enough to only store the split dimension, where you split the, uh, uh, the space and at what value you split it. And you can recreate the ha whole bounding box from the parent. Uh, so what you basically can change here is you have this KD node, which has this bounding box and these points. Uh, and then you have the KD tree filled with the, the, the all these nodes. You can change this KD node then to only be the split value and the split dimension. And then we need to add this indices lookup thing there. But the point is that this indices is not used when you're traversing down the tree. So there's no memory to fetch there. The only thing you're really using when you're traversing down the tree is this. Well, now this has become uh, very small. It's just two bytes for the split dimension and also the, the size of the value here. Uh, so basically the guiding thing here is that recomputing things and so on can be faster than storing things and fetching from memory. And making things small is uh, very useful when it comes to performance and reducing cache misses. Another thing is to specialize on the input dimension. So nearest neighbors in accepts getting input data in some different ways. Uh, you can, for example, get it as a matrix. But when you get it at a matrix, you cannot determine the dimension from that input type. So what we do is we take the cost of one dynamic dispatch to an optimized kernel that's generated for that specific dimensions. And for small dimensions, this makes quite a big difference. So if we look at the performance of evaluating the Euclidean distance between two points, if they are these S vectors, like static vectors, where the dimension is known, the, here I'm using code native just so that it's just a few assembly instructions, and it's also using some fancy stuff like AVX and so on. But if you're doing this with two, uh, just uh, two normal arrays, it has a lot of code there and it generates things like, what if this array would, would be 10,000? Then I'd need to have a bunch of code here to make it efficient for that and, and so on. Um, so I said here, a dynamic dispatch when optimized kernel can often pay off if the work the kernel has to do is big enough and sort of that it's worthwhile enough to specialize on that that thing. So here, uh, here's a good idea because quite often people use like three-dimensional points and then it makes a big difference. One thing, another thing we can do is to sort the input data to improve the cache locality when we actually have to check if the points are within the range. You know, we do a loop over all points here and we check the distance. But these points will be spread out in memory generally. So we'll have to check, OK, is this point in distance, and this point is in distance, and so on. And getting these points from everywhere in memory will also lead to cache misses. But that's what this uh, reorder argument to the constructor is for. So you can basically say that rearrange things a little bit so that when we do this loop, that, th that these points will be sequentially in memory. So to show the effect of that, I create two trees here. One which is non-ordered, which falls, and one which is ordered. And you can see that creating the ordered one it takes a bit more allocations here because we have to copy the input data and put it in the right order. But when we do the search here, we can see with it's non-ordered, it took 1.7 seconds to do this search while it was in order, it took 0 0.7 seconds. And the time to create the tree was pretty much the same. So here, it was of course worth it. So put it that the cost of copying data to put it in a cache-friendly order can be offset by future savings in better cache use. So people always try to avoid copies and so on, but sometimes doing a copy to put things nicely can be beneficial. <coughs> can also, you know, if you don't have to compute things, you could try avoid it, and it will tend to be cheaper. So we often have to check if some distance is within a given distance. So we want to check if the distance between A and B is less than some radius. But this is actually equivalent to checking that A minus B squared is within the radius squared. 
And if you think about an Euclidean distance, you typically do a square root in the end of all the sum. And a square root is actually quite expensive. You can just avoid the square root and do the square on the radius instead. Uh, so as an example here, I just tried it in the code with revised to, to disable that optimization. And then it took 3.6 seconds, and with the optimization there, it took 0 0.9 seconds. So it said no work is cheaper than some work. Just uh, sometimes you can uh, go away, uh, get away with not doing things that are actually not, not needed. Okay. So uh, did this optimization have any effect then? So I tried to find some other nearest neighbor package to like benchmark against to see like okay we're doing all this stuff but is it you know actually useful in the end and I found I didn't put the name here because it's a really old package but I found found a, a very old package uh, I had to use Julia 0 0.4 to run it <laughs> but it was at least something to compare against so in that package they have data structures like this they had some typically a little bit like I showed in the beginning they had a KD tree node it had the you see the left and right there pointers to others it has a bool there if it's a leaf, and it has the, the points there in a the vector and so on. So first I benchmarked uh, tree creations. So for some 10 to the power of n points here, where n goes from 4 to 7, I just took what the time takes to create the KD tree. And you know, for the nearest neighbors package then, you can see it kind of scales at you know, roughly proportional to the number of points, a, a bit more. I think it's n times log n. But you can see here the number of allocations is, is the same. It's just that the, the actual memory is increasing, of course, but the, the number of allocations is the same. While with this other package, you know, the, the larger the tree gets, the more things you have to allocate on the heap. So you can see as the tree gets bigger, you get more and more allocations. And especially here for the last one, you can see that the garbage collection time becomes very high because here we're allocating 300 million objects and this really pushes on the, the garbage collector. So it's not only about how much memory you allocate but also how it's much worse to have many many small allocations than having one big. So you can see here that um, going from 10 to the power of 6 to 7 it really starts to almost be non-usable anymore. And if you want to look at the time it takes to run some KNN search here, I just did it with some the same size of trees, um, and I just checked the five nearest neighbors to some 10 to the power of four points. And uh, it, the, this nearest neighbors is at least faster, but uh, at least here for the other package, the number of location kind of stays the same at least, so it doesn't have the GC problems of the creation. But what I want to say a little bit here is that, you know, one optimization makes a little bit difference maybe, but an accumulation of many optimizations can allow pretty much for new applications. Like if you have, maybe you need 10 to the power of seven points. And if you have this, you cannot really use this thing. But if you have this, maybe it's, you can actually use it. So I would say optimizations is not only about that things go a little bit fast, but it might also be that you can actually do new things. So if I put all these take-home messages in, in one slide, then is that arrays are a programmer's best friend. You know, if you can put things in an array and traverse it linearly, that typically makes the computer very happy and things go very fast. Recomputing things can often be faster than storing and fetching from memory. And you know, if you think about the, the CPU and the memory is somewhere over here, it takes time to go get it. <laughs> while if you have to recompute something, you don't have to go away and get it. And the CPUs are very, very fast. Like most of the time is spent just waiting for things to come in. So instead, you can just let the CPU do its work and try compute on things. Then uh, with the dynamic dispatch to an optimized kernel can often pay off if the work of the kernel has to do is big enough. So this was with the dimension thing where we could uh, dynamic dispatch to a specialized thing. Cost of copying data to put it in a cache-friendly order can be offset by future savings and better cache use. So this was when we changed the points a little bit so we could iterate them linearly instead of iterating them and getting them from random places in memory. 
no work is cheaper than some work, which is kind of obvious, but if you just think about it like, oh, I have to evaluate distances, then I'm just going to evaluate distances, but maybe you could just skip doing that square root, for example, and you're doing the same thing. And then finally, many optimizations can allow for new applications. Optimization is not only to make things go 2x as fast, but if things go 50x fast, you can just do completely new things. So yeah, thanks, and now we can take some questions, I think. All right, thank you for the very nice talk. So, do we have some questions? Okay, a lot of them. Um, let's start here. Sure. Um, when you're doing those really low-level optimizations, looking at cache behavior and branch and that kind of stuff, do you use CPU hardware performance counters? And if so, what's your workflow for doing that? Can I you repeat the question uh, first? So the question is, when you do this low-level stuff, are you using some kind of hardware performance counters and so on? Uh, a lot of this work was done quite a long time ago, and I remember I used this Intel VTune a bit to check cache misses and so on. Uh, yes, at least it did back then. I haven't used it lately, but uh, so I, I started this Intel VTune, which exists on Linux and Windows at least. And what you can basically run, you can run your code, and you can get the how many cache misses happened and so on. You can get kind of good instructions to see if your optimizations are useful, because that's very important. Is to always, you know profile and check that your optimizations actually do something. All right, another question? Maybe from somewhere in the back first? Yeah, so my question was about uh, when you said I'm scoring with KD3 in an array, what happens if you have a thing there? Yes, so... Repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, I'll see if I can go back to it here with this clicker. So if you store things here, are all the leaves the same depth? I told about it here that if you split points in a way that the tree is a complete binary tree, then you're going to have, you might not have all the leaves at uh, the same depth, but it's at least going to be one, one depth above. Uh, so that will be the maximum difference, uh, one depth. So you won't have very long down on the left and short on the right, for example. All right, we still have time for more over there. So the question is if this package works for points with uh, extents or only uh, like singular points. That's a good question. It might work with regions if you tweak your distance functions in, in a good way, but I'm not sure exactly what if there are further implications from it, so I, I can't say for sure. You would have to try it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question here is, is it possible to run this on GPU and maybe the comment that on a GPU brute force might be fastest. So uh, I guess that depends a little bit uh, what, what n you pick in your O of n, like if n gets big enough then you will always have, have the gain of a better data structure, but maybe for the, the sizes that that person used, uh, just doing a brute force on the GPU which can run things heavily, heavily parallelized makes sense. Running this on the GPU, I don't think it's possible. I'm not sure it, if this type of tree searching is a thing that GPUs are good for either, so I haven't done that much GPU computing, so I'm not sure, but in theory it doesn't do much um, the dynamic thing once it gets going, so I don't think it should be uh, in, theory, in theory impossible, but I just don't know if this type of uh, recursive search is something that a GPU is, is good at. It is possible you might um, you might start searching down a little bit serially, and then you know you have uh, this big thing, and then you get let the GPU start working on these many nodes in parallel down, maybe. <coughs> Sorry. Mm. Over there. Where are also optimizations that you could do for the indirect search? 
Yeah, I guess then it's just you can do threading, for example, where you try to use all your threads. You can make sure that your comparisons are as, as fast as they can possibly be. You can still use this uh, uh, this optimization that you don't have to do the the square root, for example. So then it's more, you know, you have to m try to make this loop really tight. And as the previous qu question person, then offloading that to a GPU might be a very good idea because, you know, you have a, a lot of work, a lot of simple work that you want to do, and GPUs tend to be good at that. Yeah, there in the back. Yes. Is that, are there common cases where that's relevant, or, or is that not really such a big problem? So, uh, can the you repeat? Yes. Yeah. The, the question is sort of that this, uh, these boxes here are axis aligned, so if you would sort of rotate the whole thing, you would get a whole set, new set of boxes. So I guess it could be possible somehow to do a transformation first, to sort of rotate things I in a good way, and I don't know the research about that. Maybe there's something that everyone knows that does this properly, that you should always, you know, rotate it like in this way first to get this spread in some way, and then things will be a lot better. So I think, I mean, these KD trees are, they are like axis aligned. And so I think it's up to you kind of to, to pre-rotate things and then back. But I don't, I don't know the sort of research on that. Time for one last question. Yep. A related problem uh, is statistical models based on recursively positioning data. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you know of any of the packages that are building on this, uh, like using this to generate proposals uh, with that kind of thing for those kind of models? So the question is uh, if there's any similar package or some package that builds on this to generate kind of st statistical models. Um, I don't know that. Maybe someone else in the audience uh, knows, but uh, I personally don't don't know it. But I mean, there's there's a lot of this. You know, you, you create clusters and finding things like that. So I'm sure googling a little bit might might find something useful. But I don't I don't know personally. All right. So let's thank uh, Christopher again for the nice talk.